you don't need to do like a lot of work to get this in the right shape, but this will help you explain things very quickly. Okay. So any any questions on the, on the posters or yeah, and send them to the class email address, the data mining or the UU data mining at Gmail, whatever that is. Um, and that way I'll make sure to keep track of them and it won't there'll be a separate chain of email. Um, I, I haven't uh, checked yet on uh, if, if you reply, but I put I listed I, I put a list on on the, on the class group with all the uh, a bunch of titles for all the posters, so you can you know go go and get a preview of what other people's posters are kind of about. And some of you in your reports did not include titles; you just said like final report. And so in that case, I just made up a title. Um, if you want me to change it, then just send me an email. Or if I didn't, if I spelled something wrong or whatever. All right. So are there any? any no, everyone's got the posters under control. So. Okay. And and either I will just say you know. The, Everything looks fine, and and I'll just um, I'll forward it to Chris Coleman, or I'll tell you to that you need to make some changes uh, if if I don't think it's up to up to standard or it's not quite following what I what I ask you. Okay. Um, all right. So. Um, we're back to MapReduce. Um, um, so let me just, so the topic of today will be how to do page rank efficiently on a MapReduce system. So let me start by reviewing MapReduce because it seemed like this was new for most of you last Wednesday. Um, so the idea is your um, um, data is stored Um, distributed and this data is going to be stored and replicated in ways that you don't have to worry about but it's already on a bunch of on a bunch of machines and what you need to worry about is just these these two steps um, the first step is um, is the map step and this takes your data and converts it into these key um, value pairs um, there's there's going to be a shuffle step um, which, which is something that you don't need to worry about yourself. Um, this will, um, th what this is going to do is it's, it's essentially going to sort um, these key value pairs. Um, so um, all um, pairs with the um, same K are on the same um, machine. So that your data is sort of distributed on this cluster of uh, uh, many machines. And so this will take care of, of a lot of issues. If if one of the machines goes down, it'll this data is stored in a distributed way and it's replicated, so it'll go and find um, one of the other uh, instances of that data. If one of the machines gets really slow, it will it will go find another instance of it. Right? And it'll figure out how to just redistribute these. So this is all done by the scene. Um, then the second thing that you need to do is, is the reduce step, and it, this will take um, some set of these items, um, which everything has the same key, um, and it, it's going to do some, some computation and output to one key value pair or a set of key value pairs as um, like so, so possibly some function of k and then some other function of um, yeah. um, so, so so it's going 
So it's probably going to take all the values that you've mapped to the same location and then do some computation on them. So um, there's this weird kind of trade-off um, with the locality of data. If you're, if you're doing parallel processing, um, it's important to have all the data that you need to do the computation locally in one spot. But that localness is bad for being able to do things in parallel because all the data you need is on the same machine. That would be slow. So you store it so it's far apart. This also allows it to be um, resilient to things going down. And then the map, reduce, the map phase is how it allows you to get the data all to the same location that you need to work on it. And, and then the reduce phase does the actual computation you want to do on all the data, which is somehow similar that needs to be compared for you know, some sort of function. Um, so this map phase may be some sort of parsing on your data. Um, and sometimes there's some more work goes on here. Sometimes all the work is in this reduced step. In, in actuality, the real runtime is going to be in this shuffle step, which has gone on behind the scenes. Now there's this open source to do where some of this is actually slower than I'd like it to be, but there are other implementations, either some in some academic ones or some inside Google, which are going to hopefully be much faster. Okay, so, so let me go through a couple of simple examples before we get back to um, the page right now. Um, so the, the first example that we did last time was the word count. Where your where your data is is going to be some um, you know is a large um, um, text document. So it's going to be a bunch of you know words with spaces in between them, and maybe there's punctuation that you ignore. And the goal is to um, so count number of times each word um, appears in, in the, okay, so, so this is the simplest MapReduce um, program, basically. This is like the hello world of MapReduce. Okay, so, um, so who remembers um, the two operations I need to do for Map and Reduce? That means that once you've shuffled, you have everything aligned by the key. So all the things with the same word, say if this word is, is pi, then everything with pi is going to be here. What you're going to get as input is, is, is going to be a set of, it's going to be like pi1, pi1, I want. And, and we can think of this as the value v1, v2, and v out. Okay. So, so, so then, how do we create the output here? You sum up the values for each unique key. Uh, great. Right. So we map this to pi, and then this is just the sum of, of all these values vi. And in this case, they're all one. So you're just counting the number of instances. So, I mean, I guess the programmer in me is saying, okay, well, we're cycling through the list twice to do this. I, I guess in one word, we're cycling through it n times to, to find each, each word and just throw it in a bucket. And then the second time we're cycling through, we're just combining the same words. And I, I don't know, that seems a little inefficient to me, but I guess it's still just a big O event, to, to, or big O, it's still just linear time. Yeah, so when you're dealing with MapReduce, the, um, the traditional big O's don't don't work the same way, actually. Um, the, 
there's usually, you're usually going to make one pass through the data here and one pass through the data here. Maybe sometimes you do something a little bit more complicated. Um, but the real time is actually the shuffling, the number of keys, key value pairs you need to send. So that this is going to be the cost. You want to minimize the amount of data sent on the shuffle. And sometimes you do multiple rounds of these, you string them together. And then you want to minimize the number of rounds. Those tend to be actually the amount, the real bottleneck of this cost. Now, there, there's some things where you can, uh, um, there, there's some situations where you can hide more, more, more computation inside the map and reduce and make that, so that's the, the bottleneck. But in general, the bottleneck is the shuffle phase, actually. The, the, the thing that you actually don't have to do. <coughs> so this should be optimized behind the scenes. Um, the, the other thing is you're making two passes, but they're not on the same machine. This data, this map base is made on the data which is stored in many different computers, right, on different hard drives. And so you're doing them all in parallel. So, um, and, and you can't do this final thing until you have everything together. You can't add all these up. Okay, so th there's, th there's one more phase that I skipped, which, because it's, it's optional, uh, uh, this is called the combiner phase. And it's labeled 1.5 because it goes between the map and the shuffle. Right? So this is an optimization you can do where you, um, you can essentially do something to all the key value pairs. So this data is stored in these, on a hard drive, but in blocks of size, say, 64 megabytes. And so for all the data inside the block, you can pre-process all these key value pairs before you send in a shuffle fix. And this will reduce the amount of work in the communication in the shuffle phase, which is really the bottom. So the you somehow take you know you, all of your um, all these key value pairs that you are about to send, and you convert them into some other key value pairs. You can only do this on like a local block of text. So think of like uh, like one document, right? If you're looking at a bunch of of, uh, of newspaper articles. So it'd probably be like like all of the Wall Street Journal articles for like 15 years. Think of all of the articles in one issue of the Wall Street Journal. That would be about one block of text. Um, so now, how can you speed this up um, by adding a combiner phase here in the word text? So it's after this map phase where I have all the words in these key value pairs. And, and at the end, I'm just going to add these up once I get them together. Right? But if, if I have the word the, right, which is going to occur a lot of times, the same, the same block of text here is going to produce a bunch of these key value pairs where it's the word the and one. And then there's another going to be the and one. Right? So before I send these off, I'm going to combine them into one thing, right? So, so usually the combiner looks a lot like the reducer. So I'm going to do the same thing I did here on the reducer um, in this combiner. So um, so let me just say it's going to be the So it's going to be the same as the reduce. So all the instances of the word pi in my block, I can combine them to a single count. <coughs> right? And then from all the blocks, they're all going to get different counts of, of the word pi in these, different, uh, these, these separate blocks. And then they're all going to be on the same machine here, and then I can add these all up. So instead of adding things which are 1, I can add things which are the number of instances of this word pi on all these blocks. Does combine the blocks as a number? Yeah, so it's, um, right, so it's kind of like a local reducer. Now, you can do other things at, at, at this step and <coughs> instead of exactly what's on the reducer. It's not always exactly the same. Um, but but in, in simple things like this, it'll, it'll often be the same. 
So it's kind of like a pre-processing step before the shuffle because that's because that's where all the time is. Okay, so let me do another slightly question. Yep. Just may, maybe I'm not understanding this correctly, but on the map, I mean, the map is done on multiple processors or multiple machines. Is, correct. is that correct? So we could, we could have one document on one processor and another document on another. And they might, processor one with document one might find the 50 times. And the combiner on processor one, document one, is just going to take the, combine them to maybe like 50 times that it's found, and then shoot it to kind of the, the, the shuffle set, um, which will then take all the all the different does from all the processors, put them into one, and then at that point reduce them down. Am I, am I, did I get that correct? I'm right. Oh sweet. Uh, um, that's exactly correct. So it should be it, it, it should be very simple, right? So each of these steps are typically going to be a very simple thing you're doing with this data. Um, and so it's, you know you're just writing the simple command, this simple program to run. But then the, the, the system behind it is doing this in parallel on all these machines. It's, now, the map is done where the data is stored. You're bringing the computation to the data. And then um, this reducer, the shuffle is redistributing it so it's on some set of machines which have empty processing power. right? And then this reducer is just doing the extra work you need to do to combine everything together. Right, so, so this will also be done in parallel. And, you know, as a programmer, you probably are, are not aware of how it's done in parallel. There are, there are some tools that you can look at to see how long the different processors are, are, um, are, are running and kind of get an idea. But, but generally, you can just write these simple things and just run it. So th this was designed so that a, a lot of employees in, in Google even who weren't you know, used to running on multiple parallel machines could do all, all the simple tasks and scale them up to huge, huge data sets. Otherwise, this was this was a pain. Even streaming through this on one processor may take a long time. But you know, if you're only going to do it once and you have a thousand processors sitting around, you, you'd like to do it a thousand times faster, or almost a thousand times faster. So that's what this is. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so let's go with another very simple example. Um, so you have, um, um, so you're going to have a, um, um, again, you're going to have a large text corpus, um, but th this is going to be on pages. Um, so, so example may be all of Wikipedia, right? So you have all the different pages of Wikipedia. Each of them has a bunch of text, but each text is then associated with the page, right? So, this, so you're going to have blocks of text on these pages, right? And, um, and so what you want, um, the goal um, is an index from each word to the, um, the pages which um, contain it, right? So if you remember when we talked about page rank, the, the actually the, the search engine builds an index so that when you search for a keyword, it returns just the uh, returns the pages that have a keyword with some other functions for ranking, right? So, so this is building, this is this inverted index that you're building, but now you're doing for Wikipedia, right? Or you could do this for web pages the same way. So you want for every word, you want all pages that uh, that contain this word. Okay, so. All right, so how do we do this? Well, we'd start by each processor just, uh, I guess, picking out a page at a time, or each, each, each. Yeah, so don't worry about how the processors work. Just think you have some some uh, some text in front of you, mm -hmm. right? It's, a, so it's got a bunch of words on it. It's associated with the page. 
So I think, I mean, our goal is to find if the page contains the words, so therefore we want to index the pages, therefore we just... Um, um, so what do key value pairs look like? I think, it's, I, I think it's kind of a hash set, because we just want to see whether it exists or not. So, I mean, so it just well, be able so, to... So what goes in the key and what goes in the value, right? So, so we're going to have some, this, this text, um, We're going to have a key and a value. Word URL. Oh, right, right. So, so, um, so this is the word that we're going to index, and this is the URL or the the name of the page. Right. So we would we would uh, also. And include duplicates. So if a page included the word more than once, would we include that on there, or are we just not keeping any sort of concept of? Um, so, so, so you just want a list of all the pages which um, which contain this word. So if it's contained twice, you don't you only need it, it once, right? So you can create all these these uh, key value pairs in the first step, and then in in, in the combiner step you can then um, filter out duplicates. And the combiner would then just be removed duplicates here. So. And so this is just gonna be. Um, all right, so then, um, so then what are we doing on this reduce step? So then we, um, it's going to be a bunch of word and page, page one. And so the output is this word and this union. Okay, so, so then for each word, this index just gives us a list of all the pages which contain it. And the union will that's taken care of duplicates. And so if we want to build a search engine, instead of just taking the union, we'd actually sort them based on some score, right? Based on how well they match this work. So we might actually, if we're building a search engine, instead of just passing the page, we also pass some characteristics of the page. Right? If we knew the page rank value of the page, we could pass this along inside of the value as well. It doesn't just need to be a single value of the page. It can be a bunch of information stored here. It can be other attributes like how many times this, this word occurred. That could, you know, that's a very simple heuristic for allowing us to rank it. The more it occurred, you know, and maybe how much it occurred is a fraction of the number of words on the page. You can encode some extra information in here, and then you can build a search engine. Right? So this is a very simple way to build a search engine. Okay, so um, so this allows you something a little bit more on the reduce. Let me just go through another simple example um, how to do a little something more on the map. Um, so phrases, so this is, um, it's, it's the same as index. set of um, three words. So instead of a single word, we want a consecutive set of three words, right? Um, you know, for instance, in the house. All right, so this would be a set of three words. Um, so now we want for any set of three words, we want to know which pages contain that consecutive set of three words somewhere on them. So, so how do we change this index slightly to do this? Well, wouldn't we just have the K shingle, I guess three shingle in this case, be the, the um, key, and then we'd have to have some sort of index on where it existed in the page, or whether it just existed or not, so the count of... 
All right, so the, the only difference is that we is that in the map days, instead of looking for every word, we take every three shingle of the words, right? So we say, um, he was in the house. Then you have one shingle for this, one shingle for this, and one shingle for this, right? So it's still a linear scan over the data. Um, you can still do this quickly, but you build up a more richer representation for your things. And then um, the reduce and the, the combiner phase are you know, still the same. Or maybe on the combiner phase is where you add this extra information about the page that you've calculated as you're streaming over it. All right, so. Uh, how do they implement uh, contextual search to this? Because uh, now they have, like, if you're searching for doors and home improvement stuff, then if you search for windows, it is showing real physical windows because they know you're doing home improvement. But if you search for oh, MF Microsoft Office and software, and then you search for Windows, it will show you Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows XP. So how does it do that? Is, is it implemented on this level, or is it on a different level? Um, this, so, so I'm not exactly uh, sure how they do it, but I can kind of guess. Okay. Um, and, and I don't think it's so much built on this level. Um, you're still built an index the same way, but you're keeping different information along with the page about some topic that the page is, is associated with. Okay. Right? So there are these techniques called topic models that okay. you probably use to know different topics associated with the page. And so then if your search history reveals that your searches correspond to an existing topic, then when you do the sorted, when you have a sorted order around the pages instead, you can sort the ones higher, which are closer to the topic you've recently been searching. Okay. So you can, you can instead of just doing the cosine distance on the text of the page with your query, you can also do it on the topics of the page with the topics you've been searching. Okay. So, and then, so this would be a way. You also look at like I think the sites that if it's if you were Windows is on CNET, then it's the software Windows, and if it's on Home Depot, then the window is the physical window. Right, right, right. So, so you would you would somehow build in some topic model into this data you associate with the page, which allowed you to rank them. Okay. Um, okay. So, this, so are there any kind of general questions on how this map reduce works? It should, it should generally be pretty simple. All the operations. Um, Okay, so, so th this was all dealing with, with text, which is pretty straightforward to deal with. There's a very linear sequence of how to, how to deal with them. Um, but when we're doing with the, so, so this is you know important building a search engine. This is how you build the index, which is allow you to do the fast queries. But the other key part is of that is the page rank. And so this is also on massive data, so we want to somehow calculate the, the, um, the page rank of all the web pages as well. Um, and we do that before we build this index so that we could associate with this page when we put it inside this map. So I'll keep this one up so it's fresh. Okay, so Let's see, so, all right, so let's recall about page rank. Um, and so the, the key to this was we, we had this queue, um, which is a distribution on Pages. So this Q is going to be a vector with a value for every page on the web, right? And so it's the distribution on pages, say, of a um, random um, surfer. So we're going to assume the surfer started either in some location or 
maybe randomly in some distribution, and then we want to see where this surfer may have likely gone if they were surfing or by, and, and the surfing process is described by this matrix P, um, which is, is going to be beta times M plus one minus beta times, uh, um, times D. And so this, this M is, uh, so this, this M is the normalized uh, um, adjacency matrix um, of um, links, right? So if you go one column, this describes one web page, and you look at all the outgoing links, and it's zero for any any element of that column that does not have a link to that associated page. And then you, if there's going out to, to t different pages, the value is one over t if it's on, um, on if, if it's going to that page. Right, so if you look at m, um, so one column, this, this corresponds to um, page j, and this, element is 1 over t, this is mij, this element right here, if there are t links on this page, and if one of those links goes to this ith page, right, to page i. So, so this is this matrix m, this, this beta is usually um, 0.9 or 0.85, um, so it's some damping matrix, and this, this data is, is, is actually describing that you have a probability of going to every, um, to every possible page. Um, so, um, so this is actually going to be a, um, so, equals 1 over n for all i j. So from every page, you have a chance to jump to a random page. So this is um, like allowing you to teleport to a random page. If you get bored, you, you, you jump to a random web page and start from Okay. Um, so, so then um, what we want to do is calculate um, QT, which is equal to P to the power T times some q0 that we start at, right? So, so we're going to start at some initial state of a random surfer and apply this model t times and get to the state t. And we're going to do this for t equals to, say, 50. And this will converge to the distribution of a random surfer where 85% of the time he clicks on a random link and 15% of the time, they jump to a completely random web page. Okay? Um, so, so we want to calculate this QT. And we're given some initial Q, maybe that was the guess of what the random surfer was doing at the end of last night. And then we're doing it again tonight, and we're getting a new QT. So, okay, so, um, we talked that there are multiple ways of how to calculate, of how to do this calculation. And the way I've written it up here is probably about the worst way of doing it. Um, I've taken a matrix which is going to be very sparse, and by taking it to the teeth power, it's going to be made probably very dense. There's kind of these, these uh, ideas that you can get from any page to any other page and like, um, something like seven or ten clicks. So if I took this to the power seven, then from every page, it's saying I can get to, through some sequence of clicks, to every other page. So this then means that this is going to be dense. In fact, this matrix B is already dense. Right, so if, even if I do one step up here, I have some chance of jumping to a random page. So, so even one iteration of one value of P is dense. Um, 
Okay, so, so, um, so actually, you're going to treat this. Um, you're going to treat this as QT is, or you're going to say that for i equals one, one two t, you're going to do um, QI is is equal to. Um, Beta m qi minus one plus um, one minus beta times one over n. Right. So I don't have to store this exactly. I know every element in here is getting this this one over n term, and. And, and here now this is sparse, so this computation of a vector times a sparse matrix is, is going to be much faster multiplying it by a dense matrix. And this beta is just a scale. Okay, so I'm going to try and do this with the for loop, and each of these loops, each of these loops is, is going to be one round of map reduce. Right, so I'm going to do T of these rounds of map reduce. Each round of map reduce is going to be, you know, a map to shuffle and reduce them. And so it could be that there's some like overhead of doing a round. Maybe it's it's like five minutes, but I have I can run this at, at night. At least this is way, the way it was, uh, you know, in the in the in the early 2000s. They would run this, you know, once a day or something. Now they're kind of updating this continuously. Um, okay. Um, all right, so, so, so now the, the key thing is going to be to figure out how to do this efficiently in, in, in this step efficiently inside MapReduce, just one round of this world. Okay, so what's, so the, the, the key challenge here, um, Um, but the key challenge is that um, both Q and M are huge, right? Q is lists every page on the web. And, and M is not just every page on the web, but it is describing its links as well. Right? I don't need to store this matrix B explicitly, this teleportion matrix. This I don't have to worry about. But M and Q 